An interesting question that is often asked by certain individuals in revisionist circles is, what if Hitler had decided not to attack the Soviet Union and instead maintain the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact? This question puts forth an interesting set of alternative historical timelines that could have taken place. Before one explores this question, however, one must first understand what events and circumstances led up to the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, both from the perspective of the Third Reich as well as the perspective of the Soviet Union. Though there are many details that further paint a clearer picture of the reasons as to why history played out the way that it did, for the sake of time constraints, this video will focus on the most consequential details. Overseeing the Soviet Union's establishment in 1922, Joseph Stalin came to power following Vladimir Lenin's death in 1924. Stalin's socialist vision for the Soviet Union was marked with greater centralization of power, the introduction of pro-family policies such as the abolition of abortion, and financial incentives for marriage for the purpose of cultural development as well as increasing birth rates. Stalin's reign also brought forth many purges in the state's administration, which caused many anti-Stalinist political enemies to flee the Soviet Union. Stalin's purges would later be described as anti-Semitic by many Jewish voices, although this is a clear exaggeration. Stalin incorporated nothing more than a personal friend-enemy distinction, which drove his actions. Nevertheless, Stalin's vision for the Soviet Union was upsetting for rivals such as Leon Trotsky. After Stalin's pro-family policies were passed, Leon Trotsky would start describing Stalin as a fascist in his writings. These changes in the Soviet Union did not go unnoticed in Germany. Soon after Hitler and the NSDAP came to power in 1933, German intellectuals and administrators paid close attention to the ever-changing developments in the East. It was already well known in Germany that the Soviet Union outlawed Freemasonry in 1922. At one of the Second International meetings, Grigory Zinoviev demanded the purge of all Masons. Thus, much like in the fascist states, Freemasonry did not exist in the Soviet Union, China, nor most other communist states. The Germans understood that while the Soviet Union did have agents in the East who were working hard to subordinate the Soviet Union to the capitalist interests of London and New York, there were also many sincere believers in the Workers' Revolution who genuinely opposed the attempts by Britain and France to undermine the Soviet Union's right to self-determination. Out of this context, one may better understand why and how Stalin's purges were viewed by Hitler in Germany as well as Mussolini in Italy. Both Hitler and Mussolini would follow suit and engage in similar purges as well as the banning of Freemasonry in their respective countries. There was even an air of mutual respect between Hitler, Mussolini and Stalin throughout the 1930s. Stalin was very impressed by Hitler's Night of the Long Knives in 1934, telling Nikolai Yezov, quote, That's how it's supposed to be done, quick and complete, end quote. According to Joachim von Ribbentrop, Hitler admired Stalin, hailing him as a great leader and visionary. Both Italy and Japan would continue to develop better diplomatic relationships with the Soviet Union than they would with Britain and America. On September the 2nd of 1933, Italy and the Soviet Union would sign the Pact of Friendship, Neutrality and Non-Aggression between Italy and the Soviet Union, also simply known as the Italo-Soviet Pact. Out of the three main Axis nations that would later fight the Soviet Union, it can be argued that it was Benito Mussolini's fascist Italy that had the most impressive, friendly diplomatic relations with the Soviet Union. Benito Mussolini was himself a Marxist in his younger years, and had an impressive charisma that spoke to the working class of Italy. When Mussolini's fascists marched on Rome in 1922, Vladimir Lenin stated, quote, What a waste that we lost Mussolini. He is a first-rate man who would have led our party to power in Italy, end quote. Even more impressive were the number of Italian Marxists who embraced the dawn of fascism in Italy. 
One of the founders of the Italian Communist Party, Nicola Bombacci, stated, quote, Fascism has made a grandiose social revolution. Mussolini and Lenin, Soviet and fascist corporate states, Rome and Moscow. Several stands already taken had to be rectified. We have nothing of which to ask pardon for, as both in present and past we are impelled by the same ideal, the triumph of labor over capital. End quote. Similarly, the then leader of the Italian Communist Party, Palmiro Togliatti, stated, quote, We communists adopt the fascist manifesto of 1919, the platform for peace, liberty, and defense of workers' interests. Black shirts and Africa veterans, we call on you to join us in this program. We proclaim that we communists are ready to fight on your side, the fascists of the old guard and fascist youth, in order to realize the fascist platform of 1919. End quote. The success of Italian fascists and communists to work together and better understand each other's mutually aligned goals would translate to an impressive trade relationship between the Soviet Union and fascist Italy. It would also bring forth a greater stability in the Balkan region that would help keep British and French influences at bay. For the Japanese, it was clear that America saw the Japanese Empire as a threat to her interests in Asia, and that bold acts of provocation were constantly being undertaken against the Japanese Empire by Britain and America. From an economically pragmatic view, it was logical for the Japanese Empire to attempt to engage in good diplomacy with the Soviet Union with the hope of encouraging trade for resources. Japan being very resource poor, required the aid of a resource-rich power, and the Soviet Union was both resource-rich as well as geographically well-placed for Japanese interests. Unfortunately for Japan, however, the expansion of Manchukuo into Mongolia due to badly marked territorial lines resulted in an undeclared war between the Soviet Union and Japan known as the Soviet-Japanese border conflicts. These interwar skirmishes would take place from the 1st of March 1932 to the 16th of September 1939. Despite these unfortunate circumstances, Japanese and Soviet diplomacy would break through two years later on the 13th of April 1941 with the signing of the Soviet-Japanese Neutrality Pact. The signing of this pact would mark a period of a few months in which Germany, Italy, Japan, and the Soviet Union were on the best of terms with each other. And it is the potentially alternative outcomes of these developments that will be herewith further explored. 1935 marked the year in which Joseph Clemens Pilsudski passed away. Up until this point, Germany was developing an excellent relationship with Poland, which was quickly gearing up to become a potential ally to Germany against the warmongering British and French. 67, hero of Poland and one of her greatest men, Marshal Joseph Pilsudski is dead. The dictator may be said to have rebuilt the country he loved so well, and his death leaves Poland the shuttlecock of European politics. The great man's successor has an unenviable task. Will his people now incline to the domination of France or of Germany, with a Poland? Diplomatic relations between Germany and Poland would sour immediately after the ascent of Edward Ritz Smigli to the position of General Inspector of the Polish Armed Forces. The mantle of the late Marshal Pilsudski falls on General Ritz Smigli, Inspector General of the Polish Army. With impressive ceremony, the Marshal's baton is presented to the General in the court of the Royal Castle Warsaw by the Polish President Moschiski. General Ritz Smigli has a great tradition to uphold, for his predecessor is regarded as the liberator and greatest national hero of his country. Smigli had imperialistic ambitions for Poland and had a deep-seated hatred of Germany. A Freemason who worked closely in line with the interests of London, Smigley took every action to provoke Germany to war. Following the presentation, the general proceeds to the Mokotov airfield, where he is cordially congratulated by foreign military representatives prior to a grand march past in honor of the newly appointed Marshal of Poland. Smigley exploited the Danzig and Bromberg questions for this very purpose. 
the 1939 atrocities that were either directed or allowed to occur by the Polish state against the 98% German ethnic majorities in those areas were given the blessings of Smigli. It has been reported that on the 6th of August 1939, Smigli stated, quote, Poland wants war with Germany, and Germany will not be able to avoid it even if she wants to, end quote. Similarly, Smigli's Poland engaged in committing atrocities against Ukrainians and Belarusians who were trapped in territories that had been illegally annexed by Poland. Like Germany, the Soviet Union attempted to resolve these problems by diplomatic means, but Britain and France ensured that no such resolutions could be reached. These Polish provocations against the Third Reich and the Soviet Union drove both powers to recognize the common interests at play. The insolence of the Polish state was recognized by both sides, as well as the opportunity that arose out of shared common interests. Mainstream history will claim that the Third Reich and the Soviet Union attacked Poland out of their own imperialistic ambitions. This is however false. Both the Third Reich and the Soviet Union attacked Poland in order to defend themselves against Polish aggression. Poland, under Pilsudski, maintained good diplomatic relations with both Germany and the Soviet Union, and was rather quite skeptical of Britain and France. The radical change under Smigli made it quite clear that Poland had been reduced to nothing more than a Judeo-Anglo proxy state and Masonic springboard for Britain and France to incite conflict in Europe for the benefit of the British and French plutocracy. On the 23rd of August 1939, the Third Reich and the Soviet Union signed the Treaty of Non-Aggression between Germany and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, also simply known as the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of Non-Aggression. By this time, Germany and the Soviet Union were on the greatest of friendly diplomatic relations yet. Two months before the signing of this pact, Dr. Robert Ley, leader of the German Workers' Front, mocked Britain for failing to convince the Soviet Union to take a hostile stance against Germany. Ley wrote an article in Dr. Joseph Goebbels' magazine Der Angriff on the 9th of June 1933. Quote, All this is harmless and would be a matter of indifference to us if its sound and fury were confined to England. The English can do as they please with their island and on their island. But this position is completely altered when England begins trying to infect other nations, particularly our immediate neighbors, with her own hysteria. Then the joke has gone far enough. For England will not attack alone. As always, she will try to borrow a sword on the continent to do the fighting for her. To the last French soldier is already a household expression. First it was the Dutch who were employed against the Spaniards, then the Prussians against Napoleon, then the French against the Germans. Always the same old story. Now, it seems, the Poles are to accept this honorable role of pulling chestnuts out of the fire for England. It must be confessed that Poland is a little weak, indeed, very weak. And so, England hopes to strengthen the Poles by the addition of the Soviet Union. But horror of horrors! The Russians will not agree quite so easily. It had been thought that Russia was so firmly in tow with the Anglo-Jewish politicians that there would be no difficulty at all. And so London is badly disillusioned. Consternation, dismay, and rage. Russia has laid down her own conditions. She refuses to be harnessed to the English chariot in return for nothing. Moscow remembers too well the fate of the last Tsar, who also once allowed himself to become involved in Edward VII's policy of encirclement of Germany, and who paid for it with his crown, his lands, and finally with his life. Stalin is too familiar with his predecessor's history to repeat his mistakes." End quote. After failing to solve the Danzig question by generous diplomatic means, Hitler finally decided to liberate the Germans stuck in the Danzig Corridor. On the 1st of September 1939, one week after the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between Germany and the Soviet Union, and one day after the Supreme Soviet of the Soviet Union had approved the pact, Germany invaded and liberated Danzig. 
The German Wehrmacht was greeted with joy and thankfulness. The massacres against Germans ended the very same day, and the Polish forces were swiftly defeated throughout the entire month. Similarly, the Soviets invaded and liberated Poland on the 17th of September. On the 18th of September, 1939, after avoiding capture by Soviet and then German troops, Ryd Smigli escaped to Romania and was interned. The crossing of the Polish government into Romania prevented Poland from having to officially surrender and allowed Polish soldiers to continue the fight against Germany. Smigli's Polish government in exile would later find refuge in France and after France's surrender in 1940, it would find refuge in Britain. The German-Soviet Boundary and Friendship Treaty, also simply known as the Hitler-Stalin Frontier Pact, was signed on the 28th of September 1939. Several fine print articles were attached to the treaty. These articles allowed for the exchange of Soviet and German nationals between the two occupied zones of Poland. It redrew parts of the central European sphere of interests dictated by the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and also stated that neither party to the treaty would allow on its territory any Polish agitation directed at the other party. This momentous occasion was highlighted by joint German-Soviet military marches and celebrations as shown in the following footage. The 60th anniversary of the great victory, an historical parade, no less historical than the first Soviet victory parade in World War II, together with the Nazis. The commandierenden Generale der deutschen und sowjetrussischen Truppen nahmen gemeinsam den Vorbeimarsch ihrer Formationen ab. The Soviets never emphasized that they were parading under the Nazi flag. Officially, Moscow portrayed itself as an epic anti-fascist fighter. Many people believed it. Many Jews fled to the USSR to be protected from Hitler. And then, Stalin did something unimaginable. He rounded them up and delivered them back to the Gestapo as a gesture of friendship. Take a look at this footage again. The Soviet officer greeting his SS colleagues with a Nazi salute. Soviet 
заключении советско-германского договора о ненападении свидетельствует о том, что историческое предвидение товарища Сталина блестяще оправдалось. Soviet and Nazi officers were meeting and discussing the progress of the war. This is December 1939. The progress was good, and the prospects looked even better. There was reason to celebrate. Nach den ersten russischen Getreidelieferungen the Soviet Union became the main supplier of resources for the Nazi war machine. Thousands of tons of oil, iron ore, construction materials. Even trainloads of Soviet grain were sent to the German army. Soviet Premier Molotov went to Berlin to discuss the post-war world order. He arrived with a list of territories the USSR was interested in. While Hitler and Molotov were discussing it, the other Soviet comrades enjoyed the company of Goebbels, who must have talked about the advantages of Nazism, because it was the Soviet Premier Molotov and not Goebbels who warned the West not to fight Nazi ideology. More than that, in his address to the Supreme Soviet in the Kremlin, Molotov declared that fighting Nazi ideology was actually a crime. It was published in all the largest Soviet newspapers. Later, that page will disappear from the public libraries of the USSR, along with many other pro-Nazi statements of the Soviet government. But why was fighting Nazism a crime in the Soviet view? When M. Molotov delivered his speech on the 31st of October 1939 at the extraordinary fifth session of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR, Poland, as a separate state, had ceased to exist. Within less than three weeks of the German invasion of Poland, the German mechanized armies powerfully assisted by their air force, had succeeded in breaking her effective resistance. Poland collapsed even more quickly than military experts had predicted. At the same time, Britain and France, for all their guarantee, were unable to, or at any rate did not, give the Poles any help. When it became evident that the Polish state had ceased to exist, the Soviet government marched its troops into western Ukraine and western Belarusia in order to save the people from the ravages of war and to unite them with the main body of the Ukrainian and Belarusian peoples, from whom they were torn in 1920 by the combined efforts of Poland, Britain and France during the period of civil war and intervention when the Soviet state was in a weakened condition. The Ukrainians, Belarusians, Jews and others who had been cruelly oppressed by the Polish capitalists and landlords, as well as many Polish workers, peasants, and intelligentsia, welcomed the Red Army. On the 28th of September, 1939, a Soviet-Germany Treaty of Amity and Delimination of Frontiers was concluded, whereby the new USSR frontier was fixed roughly at the line drawn by Lord Curzon in 1920. The Soviet government thus incorporated only such territory as had a population overwhelmingly Ukrainian or Belarusian, that is, territory which formed an ethnological part of the USSR and should by general consent never have been severed from her. In his speech, M. Molotov explained the attitude of the USSR in regard to the present world war in general and to Poland in particular. The speech also dealt at some length with the Mutual Assistance Pact concluded by the USSR with Estonia on the 28th of September 1939, Latvia on the 5th of October 1939, and Lithuania on the 10th of October 1939, with the negotiations which were, at that time, proceeding with Finland as well as with the relations of the USSR with other countries. Quote, there have been important changes in the international situation during the past two months. This applies above all to Europe, 
but also to countries far beyond the confines of Europe. In this connection, we have to bear in mind that three principal circumstances which are of decisive importance. Firstly, mention should be made of changes that have taken place in the relations between the Soviet Union and Germany. Since the conclusion of the Soviet-German non-aggression pact on the 23rd of August, an end has been put to the abnormal relations that have existed between the Soviet Union and Germany for a number of years. Instead of the enmity which was fostered in every way by certain European powers, we now have a reapproachment and the establishment of friendly relations between the USSR and Germany. The further improvement of these new and good relations found its reflection in the German-Soviet Treaty on Amity and Frontier Fixation signed in Moscow on the 28th of September. This radical change in the relations between the Soviet Union and Germany, two of the biggest states in Europe, was bound to have its effect on the entire international situation. Furthermore, events have entirely confirmed the estimation of the political significance of the Soviet-German rapprochement given at the last session of the Supreme Soviet. Secondly, mention must be made of such a fact as the military defeat of Poland and the collapse of the Polish state. The ruling circles of Poland boasted quite a lot about the stability of their state and the might of their army. However, one swift blow to Poland, first by the German army and then by the Red Army, and nothing was left of this ugly offspring of the Versailles Treaty, which had existed by oppressing non-Polish nationalities. The traditional policy of unprincipled maneuvering between Germany and the USSR and the playing off of one against the other has proved unsound and has suffered complete bankruptcy. Thirdly, it must be admitted that the big war that had flared up in Europe has caused radical changes in the entire international situation. This war began as a war between Germany and Poland and turned into a war between Germany on the one hand and Britain and France on the other. The war between Germany and Poland ended quickly owing to the utter bankruptcy of the Polish leaders. As we know, neither British nor French guarantees were of help to Poland. To this day, in fact, nobody knows what these guarantees were. The war between Germany and the Anglo-French bloc is only in its first stage and has not yet really developed. It is nevertheless clear that a war like this was bound to cause radical changes in the situation in Europe and not in Europe alone. In connection with these important changes in the international situation, certain old formulas formulas which we employed but recently, and to which many people are so accustomed, are now obviously out of date and inapplicable. We must be quite clear on this point, so as to avoid making gross errors in judging the new political situation that has developed in Europe. We know, for example, that in the past few months such concepts as aggression and aggressor have acquired new concrete connotation, new meaning. It is not hard to understand that we can no longer employ these concepts in the sense we did, say three or four months ago. Today, as far as the European great powers are concerned, Germany is in the position of a state which is striving for the earliest termination of war and for peace, while Britain and France, which but yesterday were declaiming against aggression, are in favor of continuing the war and are opposed to the conclusion of peace. The roles, as you see, are changing. The efforts of the British and French governments to justify this new position of theirs on the ground of their undertakings to Poland are, of course, obviously unsound. Everybody realizes that there can be no question of restoring old Poland. It is, therefore, absurd to continue the present war under the flag of restoration of the former Polish state. Although the governments of Britain and France understand this, they do not want war stopped and peace restored, but are seeking new excuses for continuing the war with Germany. The ruling circles of Britain and France have been lately attempting to depict themselves as champions of the democratic rights of nations against Hitlerism, and the British government has announced that its aim in the war with Germany is nothing more nor less than the destruction of Hitlerism. It amounts to this that the British, and with them the French, supporters of the war have declared something in the nature of an ideological war on Germany, 
reminiscent of the religious wars of olden times. In fact, religious wars against heretics and religious dissenters were once the fashion. As we know, they led to dire results for the masses, to economic ruin and the cultural deterioration of nations. These wars could have no other outcome. But they were the wars of the Middle Ages. It is back to the Middle Ages, to the days of religious wars, superstition, and cultural deterioration that the ruling classes of Britain and France want to drag us? In any case, under the ideological flag there has now been started a war of even greater dimensions and fraught with even greater dangers for the peoples of Europe and of the whole world. But there is absolutely no justification for a war of this kind. One may accept or reject the ideology of Hitlerism as well as any other ideological system. That is a matter of political views. But everybody should understand that an ideology cannot be destroyed by force, that it cannot be eliminated by war. It is, therefore, not only senseless but criminal to wage such a war as a war for the destruction of Hitlerism camouflaged as a fight for democracy. And indeed, you cannot give the name of a fight for democracy to such actions as the banning of the Communist Party of France, the arrest of communist deputies of the French Parliament, or the curtailing of political liberties in Britain, or the unremitting national oppression in India, etc. It is not clear that the aim of the present war in Europe is not what it is proclaimed to be in official statements which are intended for the broad public in France and Britain? That is, it is not a fight for democracy, but something else of which these gentlemen do not speak openly. The real cause of the Anglo-French war with Germany was not that Britain and France have vowed to restore the old Poland, and not, of course, that they decided to undertake a fight for democracy. The ruling circles of Britain and France have, of course, other and more actual motives for going to war with Germany. These motives do not lie in any ideology, but in their profoundly material interests as mighty colonial powers. Great Britain, with a population of 47 million, possesses colonies with a population of 480 million. The colonial empire of France, whose population does not exceed 42 million, embraces a population of 70 million in the French colonies. The possession of these colonies, which makes possible the exploitation of hundreds of millions of people, is the foundation of the world supremacy of Great Britain and France. It is the fear of Germany's claims to these colonial possessions that is at the bottom of the present war of Britain and France with Germany a fear that has become substantially stronger lately as the result of the collapse of the Versailles Treaty. It is the fear of losing world supremacy that dictates the ruling circles of Great Britain and France a policy of fermenting war with Germany. Thus the imperialist character of this war is obvious to anyone who wants to face realities and does not close his eyes to facts. One can see from all this who is interested in this war that is being waged for world supremacy, certainly not the working class. This war promises nothing to the working class but bloody sacrifice and hardship. Well, now judge for yourselves whether the meaning of such concepts as aggression and aggressor has changed recently or not. It is not difficult to see that the use of these words in their old meaning, that is, the meaning attached to them before the recent decisive turn in political relations between the Soviet Union and Germany, and before the outbreak of the great imperialist war in Europe, can only create confusion in people's minds and must inevitably lead to erroneous conclusions. To avoid this, we must not allow an uncritical attitude towards old concepts which are no longer applicable in the new international situation. That has been the course of international affairs in the recent period. I shall now pass to the changes that have taken place in the international position of the Soviet Union herself. Here the changes have been of no small significance, but if we confine ourselves to essentials, the following must be admitted, namely, 
that thanks to our consistently pursued peaceful foreign policy, we have succeeded in considerably strengthening our position and the international weight of the Soviet Union. As I have said, our relations with Germany have radically improved. Here, development has proceeded along the line of strengthening our friendly relations, extending our practical cooperation, and rendering Germany political support in her efforts for peace. The non-aggression pact concluded between the Soviet Union and Germany bound us to maintain neutrality in case of Germany participating in war. We have consistently pursued this course, which was in no wise contradicted by the entry of our troops into the territory of former Poland, which began on the 17th of September. It will be sufficient to recall the fact that on that same day, 17th September, the Soviet government sent a special note to all states with which it maintains diplomatic relations, declaring that the USSR would continue her policy of neutrality in her relations with them. As is well known, our troops entered the territory of Poland only after the Polish state had collapsed and had actually ceased to exist. Naturally, we could not remain neutral towards these facts since, as a result of these events, we were confronted with urgent problems concerning the security of our state. Furthermore, the Soviet government could not but reckon with the exceptional situation created for our brothers in western Ukraine and western Belarusia, who had been abandoned to their fate as a result of the collapse of Poland. Subsequent events fully confirmed that the new Soviet-German relations were based on a firm foundation of mutual interest. After the Red Army units entered the territory of the former Polish state, Serious questions arose relating to the delimination of the state interests of the USSR and Germany. These questions were promptly settled by mutual agreement. The German-Soviet Treaty on Amity and delimination of the frontiers between the two countries, which was concluded at the end of September, has consolidated our relations with the German state. Relations between Germany and other Western European bourgeois states have in the past two decades been determined primarily by Germany's efforts to break the fetters of the Versailles Treaty, whose authors were Great Britain and France with the active participation of the United States of America. This it was which, in the long run, led to the present war in Europe. The relations between the Soviet Union and Germany have been based on a different foundation, which had no interest whatever in perpetuating the post-war Versailles system. We have always held that a strong Germany is an indispensable condition for durable peace in Europe. It would be ridiculous to think that Germany could be simply put out of commission and struck off the books. The powers which cherish this foolish and dangerous dream ignore the deplorable experience of Versailles. They do not realize Germany's increased might and fail to see that any attempt at a repetition of Versailles in the present state of international affairs, which differs radically from that of 1914, may end in disaster for them. We have consistently striven to improve our relations with Germany and have wholeheartedly welcomed similar strivings in Germany herself. Today our relations with the German state are based on friendly relations, on our readiness to support Germany's efforts for peace, and, at the same time, on the desire to contribute in every way to the development of Soviet-German economic relations to the mutual benefit of both states. Special mention should be made of the fact that the change that has taken place in Soviet-German political relations has created favorable conditions for the development of Soviet-German economic relations. Recent economic negotiations carried on by the German delegation in Moscow and the present negotiations being carried on by the Soviet economic delegation in Germany are preparing a broad basis for the development of trade between the Soviet Union and Germany." End quote.
While it would seem that peaceful German and Soviet cooperation and understanding was on the perpetual rise, one should not forget that the road that was traveled to reach these circumstances was by no means an easy one for either side. Unlike Mussolini, Hitler came to power in Germany with strong anti-Marxist rhetoric. Hitler's words in Mein Kampf regarding German interests in the East were also received with a strong skepticism of Germany. The Soviets were rather quite distrustful of Hitler and feared that Germany would eventually escalate towards a conflict between the Third Reich and the Soviet Union. Stalin's distrust of Hitler is best highlighted in a speech he gave to the Politburo on the 19th of August 1939, precisely four days before the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. Quote, Comrades, it is in the interests of the USSR, the workers' homeland, that war breaks out between the Reich and the capitalist Anglo-French bloc. Everything should be done so that this drags out as long as possible with the goal of weakening both sides. For this reason, it is imperative that we agree to conclude the pact proposed by Germany, and then work in such a way that this war, once it is declared, will be prolonged maximally. We must strengthen our propaganda work in the belligerent countries, in order to be prepared when the war ends. Therefore, our goal is that Germany should carry out the war as long as possible so that England and France grow weary and become exhausted to such a degree that they are no longer in a position to put down a Sovietized Germany." End quote. The mainstream narrative that a despicable Hitler decided to engage in a cowardly attack against the peace-loving Soviet Union is utterly refuted by the work of Russian historian Igor Bunik. Bunik does not at all intend to polish up the image of Adolf Hitler. His first intention is to analyze who is guilty of having caused the immense human losses of Russia in World War II. He discovered a document in which the total number of killed Russian soldiers is set to be 30.5 million, with 8.5 million of them directly killed in battle, 22 million who died from their wounds, and one half of that number through tetanus. In Bunich's view, Stalin is not the man responsible for these human losses, but Zhukov. Stalin was a statesman, but not a soldier. In strategic questions, he had to rely on the advice of his generals, and Zhukov was not a very talented one. Bunich himself has biases that can be ignored as unreliable. However, the documents that he uses for his work are highly credible and explain perfectly well the rationale as to why Hitler greenlighted Operation Barbarossa. It also matches up perfectly with a Reichstag speech that Adolf Hitler gave in regards to why he decided to attack the Soviet Union. According to Bunich, Operation Barbarossa was a preemptive attack on the Soviet Union after the discovery of the plans for Operatia Groza, or Operation Thunderstorm in English by the Soviet Union against the Third Reich. He bases this information on the Osobaya Papka, a file which contains 100,000 top secret documents. The specific document in question is signed by Marshal Semyon Timoshenko and the chief of the general staff at the time, Merezkov. It is dated the 18th of September 1940, roughly three months before the German Operation Barbarossa was signed. After Gregory Zukov became chief of the general staff in February 1941, the plan was called MP41. Punich points to the Russian military archives where it can be found. This document contains information about the Soviet military power in June of 1941. It had 300 divisions, 8 million soldiers, 27,500 tanks, and 32,628 airplanes. The total number of German warplanes at the time was only about 6,000, although the majority of the Soviet aircraft was obsolete. As Hitler himself stated, the decision to attack the Soviet Union was no easy one. For Germany, it was a lose-lose situation given all that they knew at the time. However, one should not overlook the alternative advice that was given to Hitler by his advisors. For example, 
Joachim von Ribbentrop was adamant that Germany allow the Soviet Union to take Finland and Romania and continue to maintain the non-aggression pact. The rationale was that regardless of circumstances, a two-front war would always be worse than a one-front war. In addition to this, Mussolini advised Hitler to take a defensive stance against the Soviet Union in case of an attack. Mussolini felt that he had a good diplomatic relationship with the Soviet Union and concluded that it would be better to either allow the Soviet Union to attack first, in the worst case scenario, or reap the benefits of both sides maintaining the pact and hopefully perhaps even seeing the Soviet Union join the Axis struggle against Britain and America. This of course would have been the best case scenario. If Germany had taken this course of action, there are mainly three scenarios that could have played out. Scenario 1. The Soviet Union remains neutral. Germany becomes the Soviet Union's sword against Britain. The pros. Germany only has to fight a one-front war. Britain would likely fall just as France did. Germany can better prepare against the likely entrance of America into the war. The cons. Soviet control of Romanian oil fields means Germany will become dependent on the Soviet Union in order to wage her defensive war against Britain. Germany will no longer be an equal trading partner with the Soviet Union, but will likely be subservient. The threat of the Soviet Union backstabbing Germany still lingers. Scenario 2. Building off of Scenario 1, Germany manages to defeat Britain. The Soviet Union finally attacks Germany. Pros. Germany only has to fight a one-front war against the Soviet Union for the time being. Germany has gained the resources of the British and French empires and has access to her own oil supply via Africa and the Middle East. Japan will gain access to the resources of all Asian territories that formerly belonged to the empires of Britain and France. Japan will likely also be in a better position to aid Germany by forcing the Soviet Union into a two-front war. Cons Germany is in a weakened state due to having just concluded a war against Britain and France. America might join and will most likely side with the Soviet Union against Germany and Japan. If America joins the war, Japan may attempt to maintain the non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union since the Axis Tripartite Pact has already been concluded. It would not be in Japan's best interest to fight a two-front war against the Soviet Union and America if it can be avoided. Scenario 3. The Soviet Union actively joins the Axis powers. Germany, Italy, Japan, and the Soviet Union form the Axis Quadripartite. Pros The immense cooperation in the war effort between the Axis powers will guarantee the equality and solidarity of all powers in the alliance. The Axis powers will be far more likely to defeat the Allies, including America, if she should attack. The possibility that America might not attack and stay out of the war due to the increased dangers. Cons. There are no significant cons to this scenario, if it somehow managed to manifest as an alternative history. The Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and the subsequent invasion of Poland had done more than facilitate a single joint military action. It laid the groundwork for future German and Soviet cooperation and partnership by dividing Eastern Europe between them, providing an opportunity for Germany to control Lithuania and the Balkans, while the Soviets would subjugate the remaining Baltic nations, Bessarabia and Finland. Both Germany and Russia recognized during the opening of the Western Front that war between their own countries would be disastrous. Germany because it would need to fight a two-front war, and the Soviets because they stood woefully unprepared. As such, it was determined that the continuation of Russo-German peace was ideal, and enduring peace which lasted at least one decade was possible if a degradation of relations was avoided. To assure this outcome, it was decided that the USSR must become a member of the Axis, and share in the post-Britain world order. Progress was made, and the Soviets did seem enthusiastic. However, debate broke out over the status of the Balkans and Finland. The Soviets had been promised Finland if they were to join the Axis, 
However, Germany had become dependent on Finnish resources during the war, and was hesitant to allow the Soviets to interfere with that. Germany and the USSR had already established a strong, mutually beneficial trade relationship during and even preceding the conflict. The Soviets provided the Germans a great deal of agricultural and raw materials, while the Germans provided the Soviets with heavy machinery. Going off of this codependent strategy, the Soviets had promised to continue delivering Finnish resources to Germany until the war was concluded. However, Germany refused, asserting that a Russian conquest of Finland at the time would risk the destruction of necessary Finnish assets, and thus, Finland remained an unresolved issue between the two countries. Additionally, there is the matter of the Balkan coast. The Soviets had wished to consolidate authority there in order to re-secure the Black Sea as Russia's personal naval harbor. Germany, as per the terms of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, granted to Russia Romania's Bessarabian lands, but resisted additional annexations. These proposals only made Germany more suspicious of the Soviet Union's intentions, and believed that the USSR may be preparing for a westward invasion while Germany was preoccupied with Britain. This was exacerbated by the apparent attempts by the Soviets to sway Bulgaria over to their side. The USSR's final proposition to Germany for its own entry into the Axis required two major conditions. First, a total withdrawal of German troops from Finland and a pact of mutual assistance between Russia and Bulgaria, who was also interested in joining the alliance. In the end, however, the proposal was ignored outright, Russia never receiving a response to this offer, while Bulgaria was accepted into the Axis. Not long after receiving this proposal, Germany, seeing partnership with the Soviets as no longer reasonable, began to work on Operation Barbarossa, a plan that was meant to speedily defeat Russia and seize its resources by force, using them to facilitate a consolidation of power in the West and the ultimate defeat of Britain. But instead, Operation Barbarossa spread the German army thin, and upon the entry of the US into the conflict, allowed the Allied powers to breach the coast of Italy and Normandy, marking the beginning of the end for the German war effort. But what if that changed? What if, in an alternate timeline, the Germans and the Soviets ended up working together? Let's suppose that Hitler accepted Soviet domination over Finland on the condition that the major resource deposits Germany was reliant on were safe from destruction and continue to be supplied to Germany at little to no cost until the end of the war. From there, the Soviet Union would become an official member of the Axis and work side by side with Germany, Italy, and Japan. Now that Hitler has the Soviets on his side, he can focus his entire attention to Western Europe. In the first few years of the war, Hitler's campaign would be similar to our timeline, where he blitzes through much of Western Europe and coerces Eastern Europe into the Axis. Along with that, Greece would likely join the Allies by this point. This is because the Greek government would realize that they're next on the Italian chopping block and would want Allied support. Soon after, the Soviets and the British would invade Iran, but the Soviets occupying the northern half and the British occupying the south. With mainland Europe wholly under Axis control, Germany can focus entirely on the planned invasion of Britain itself, Operation Sea Lion, an operation which, in our world, was scrapped in favor of Operation Barbarossa, which Germany anticipated would provide them with the added resources and security necessary to outlast the British. Instead, with the Soviets fully cooperative, that wouldn't be an issue this time around. As Operation Sea Lion commenced, the Soviet Union would begin their own conquest of Finland. Using their experience from the Winter War, the Soviets would learn from their enemy and train their troops to detect camouflage Finnish troops. In fact, much of the Soviets' fight against Finland would be in a guerrilla-style conflict, with both sides making great use of camouflage in the snow while slowly picking off the others. After about a year of fighting, the Soviets, using their massive military, would launch an all-out assault on Finland and capture Helsinki. In order to stave off rebellion, the Soviets likely wouldn't annex all of Finland, but would leave pro-Soviet leaders in charge that take orders directly from Moscow. In the east, Japan would be plowing through Asia just like in our timeline. They would conquer eastern China, southeastern Asia, and the Indies just like in our timeline, but would leave the Philippines alone. It's not that the Japanese didn't want to take the Philippines for themselves, it's just that they didn't want to anger the US too early in the war, when the situation is still volatile for them. While Japan would still be facing fuel shortages, just like in our timeline, it wouldn't be that pressing of an issue for them. The reason behind this is their new alliance with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union had one of the largest proven oil reserves in the world, 
with some of it actually being sent to the Allies in our timeline. In this timeline, since Japan would need oil, it wouldn't hurt the Russians to export some of it to Japan during their conquest of the Pacific. While the Japanese would be looking to take the Philippines and Australia just like in our timeline, they would have another major target, that being India. The only reason why Japan never attempted a full-scale invasion of India in our timeline was because they saw it as a stretch of their already low number of resources. In this timeline, with Japan having secured Soviet oil and the British Navy preoccupied with fighting the Germans, the Japanese might set their sights on the subcontinent. This actually isn't that far off from our timeline, as the Japanese actually invaded Burma with the intention to push deep into India. This actually isn't that far off from our timeline, as the Japanese actually invaded Burma with the intention to push deep into India in this timeline. That goes further, with the Japanese making landings in Chennai, Visakhapatnam, or Sri Lanka, and actually making large gains in British India cooperating with pro-independence, anti-British Indian forces under the command of Subhas Chandra Bose. Returning west, we'd find Turkey teetering on joining the Axis, who by this point would appear to be the inevitable victors. In our timeline, both Ataturk and his successor, Ismet Ononu, weren't on bad terms with the Axis, with Anonu considering joining them multiple times in the early stages of the war in order to regain historically Ottoman lands now held by the British and French. In our timeline, one of the biggest deterrents to Turkey joining the Axis was the looming Soviet threat right on their doorstep. In this timeline, that Soviet threat wouldn't exist as they're part of the Axis as well. With all this in mind, Turkey would likely join the Axis and focus their efforts on Greece as well as British colonies with the goal of controlling the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, as well as taking the holy city of Jerusalem. In fact, in our timeline, Iraq actually unofficially joined the Axis after Rashid Ali was put in charge of the country with assistance from Germany and Italy. This led to the Anglo-Iraqi War, which was essentially just a way to force Iraq into British hands in order to secure the oil fields in the region, as well as to lock down the Middle East. While the UK would still initiate the Anglo-Iraqi War in this timeline, it wouldn't last long for the British, due to the Axis-led Iraq receiving support from incoming Turkish troops. Because of that, Iraq would remain firmly in the Axis in this timeline and wouldn't be wrestled away by the British. Along with that, since France would be under Vichy rule by this point, they would allow the Turkish army unrestricted access into Syria in order to conquer Britain's Middle Eastern colonies, save for those in North Africa claimed by Italy. The Soviet Union would take notice of Turkish and Japanese ambitions in South Asia and would likely coordinate their efforts with them. I could see the USSR and Turkey jointly plowing their way through the British occupied zones of Iran, with the Soviets and Japanese now attempting to subjugate India. The Soviets would begin their side of the invasion of India and in modern day Pakistan and would coordinate an effort with the Japanese to meet up halfway through the region. I would assume that both the Soviets and the Japanese would be working with pro-Axis factions in India who believe that joining the alliance would help free India from British rule. These pro-Axis rebels would likely stage acts of terror against the British and Indian allied troops by destroying supply lines, bombing resource deposits, and overall making it difficult for the Allies to fight back against the Soviets and the Japanese. By this point, the Japanese would likely begin discussions with the Soviets about a possible invasion of the US. In our timeline, the Japanese actually made a small push to take the Alaskan Aleutian Islands, but I don't see that happening in this timeline, as they would realize that they couldn't hold it for long, and the Japanese wanted to reserve its resources. Instead, sometime around mid-1942, I would imagine the Japanese making a similar bombing of Pearl Harbor as in our timeline, except in this timeline, they would destroy the Hawaiian repair yards in order to keep the US out of the ocean for as long as possible. At the same time, Soviet warships would begin making their way over to to Alaskan port cities. I cannot see the Japanese or the Soviets actually making substantial gains in US territory besides certain colonies such as the Philippines, so for the time being, the war on the American front is confined to the ocean. Until a major shift happens, the main objective between both sides in the American theater of the war is to control the northern Pacific Ocean. While the US would want to help Britain in their fight against Germany, they wouldn't be able to send that much support due to their ongoing struggle against the Soviets and the Japanese. In our timeline, as the war approached its apparent end in Europe, last-minute players joined in, hoping to gain from the post-war spoils, Spain being the most significant. In our timeline, Franco proposed joining the Axis, but only under the condition that Spain extract disproportionately large rewards for its efforts. Of course, Spain's help was rejected, but with the conflict favoring the Axis as far as it had, 
the Spanish might try to earn something for their participation in this timeline. One of the first things that Spain would do after being admitted to the Axis is to target Britain's longtime ally of Portugal. In our timeline, Franco had grand dreams of a fully fascist Iberia. Obviously, Portugal is in the way of that, with Franco expressing his hate for Portugal on multiple occasions. I could see the Spanish government publishing propaganda across the media, painting the Portuguese in an extremely negative light, perhaps as an anti-Axis pro-British sympathizer. From there, Spain would likely do what Japan did in their invasion of Manchuria, that is, staging an attack so that the government has a valid reason to invade and subjugate the region. Back in Germany, the military higher-ups most likely would have abandoned Operation Sea Lion at this point due to Britain's plethora of funding to the Navy, repelling any German sea-based attacks. In response to this, the German nuclear bomb project would receive a surge of funding as they would likely see the use of nuclear bombs as the only way to force Britain into surrender at this point. By autumn of 1943, I could see the German atomic bomb project being given utmost importance by the Nazi government, having even recruited Soviet help by this point. For now, Germany just needs to keep control of their European holdings until they have developed a working nuclear bomb. In North America, the US Navy would be fighting a fierce battle against the Japanese in the mid-Pacific, as well as the Soviets in the northern Pacific. In this timeline, the number of resources going to the military would be significantly more than in our timeline due to fighting a much more vicious battle in the ocean. Because of this, I would expect the US to plunge into social disorder, as the people have been going without proper food for years now, as well as there not being any large military victories to keep morale up. This would all take a toll on FDR, who was already stressed out enough, and combined with a great deal of growing health issues, might die in early 1944 as a combination of all of these. His vice president at the time, Henry Wallace, wanted to end the war as quickly as possible in our timeline, but didn't have the power to do so. In this timeline, after taking office as the 33rd president, Wallace would want to speed up the production of the atomic bomb, as he would more than certainly see it as a way to force the Axis into surrender. With the American public on the verge of breaking out into full-fledged chaos, he would know that the US needs to gain a major victory as soon as possible. In order to get the major victory he needs, Wallace would likely try to spread even more American propaganda to keep the public off his back. Next, Wallace would try and build up supplies and resources for a full-scale invasion of Japan, similar to Operation Downfall in our timeline. But despite the Allies' best efforts, they wouldn't stand much of a chance of victory by this point. By 1944, the German nuclear bomb project would have borne fruit, successfully testing a bomb in the Kazakh steppes of the Soviet Union. After completion of the bomb, Hitler would send an ultimatum to Britain, obviously not expecting it to be accepted due to Churchill's obsession with never surrendering. Hitler, now in possession of atomic weaponry, would send a Messerschmitt Me-26 over Brighton carrying a nuclear bomb. As the Germans have been perfecting their bomb for years, the nuclear bomb would do substantial damage to the city, its industry, the population, and most importantly, the naval bases in the city. Before the British government can even comprehend what's going on, the Soviets would demand that the British cease all resistance in their Middle Eastern and South Asian colonies unless they want a second nuclear bomb to be dropped. The British, realizing that London could be the next atomic target, would sue for peace. The British have been on the losing side of the war for half a decade by this point. They've burned through the resources, the British public is in disarray, and their enemies now have city-destroying weapons. Because of this, the British would have no choice but to surrender. After the surrender of Britain, the last major Allied power would be the US. Henry Wallace would speed up the American nuclear project in order to get a bomb as quickly as possible, as he knows that this is the only path to victory after seeing Brighton get reduced to rubble. After months of hastily trying to create a nuclear weapon, the Americans would bear fruit in New Mexico. Although the American bomb is nowhere as strong as the German one, it's still an atomic bomb nonetheless. Making haste, the American bombs would be loaded onto B-29 bombers in Juneau and Honolulu and sent westward. The bombs stemming from Juneau would fly for days across the Russian Far East until it reaches Vladivostok, a Russian port city that would likely contain a great deal of the ships that have been harassing the Alaskan coast. The nuclear bomb would hit its target, but wouldn't do that much damage, as the bomb was created in a rush manner and had no time to be perfected. The bomb stemming from Honolulu would be aimed towards Tokyo, specifically targeting Emperor Hirohito, the man who the Japanese people saw as a god. If the Americans were to kill the Emperor, 
Japanese morale would be considerably lowered, and might even give them a chance in the Pacific. But this would not happen, as the Japanese fortifications in the Pacific would be able to repel the B-29 carrying the nuke, with an anti-aircraft gun shooting it down somewhere between Hawaii and Japan. Back in Russia, Stalin would be going ballistic over the atomic bombing of Vladivostok and would want to seek revenge against the Americans. The Germans would aid him in this, as they would also want to knock the US out of the war. The Germans would load one atomic bomb in Magadan, Russia, and another in German-occupied Venice, France, and send them towards the US. The bomb stemming from Russia would be aimed towards Los Angeles, with the intention to destroy as much as possible as revenge for Vladivostok. The bomb stemming from France would likely be aimed towards New York City, America's cultural center, in order to absolutely crush US morale. Both bombs would make contact with their intended targets, causing colossal amounts of damage to both cities. Henry Wallace, now realizing that the US has no chance of victory, after seeing two of their biggest cities destroyed, would surrender to the Axis. After years of fighting, and four cities destroyed by atomic bombs, World War II would conclude with an Axis victory. The first major change after the conclusion of the war would be the redrawing of world borders. In Europe, Germany would most likely turn the Low Countries into fascist puppets while annexing a great deal of Central Europe. Despite what many think would happen, Germany would not annex Alsace-Lorraine. This is because France, under Vichy rule, along with all of its colonies, are pretty much already under the direct rule of Berlin, causing no need for annexations, as Germany already has everything it needs from France. The Soviet Union would likely puppet a great deal of Eastern Europe under communist rule just like in our timeline. However, the Soviets wouldn't be able to exert control over as much of Eastern Europe as they did in our timeline, due to Germany having already established their own sphere of influence over the region. Since Turkey fought alongside the Axis against Greece, Turkey would likely receive Crete, along with some of, if not all of the Aegean islands from Greece. In Asia, Japan would establish complete dominance over Korea, Eastern China, the Malay Archipelago, the Philippines, Southeast Asia, and possibly even Southern India. When it comes to Australia or New Zealand, I don't expect them to come under Japanese control, but rather independent nations that are within the Japanese sphere of influence. The Soviet Union would also make massive gains in Asia, likely occupying all of Iran, Afghanistan, in the northern Indian region of Kashmir, along with a great deal of modern-day Pakistan. I don't expect the Soviet Union to actually annex these regions, but rather occupy them in a similar fashion to the Eastern Bloc, where the Soviet Union has free range to do whatever it wants within the occupied borders, most notably giving it access to warm water ports in order to end the centuries-old Russian problem of ports freezing over for half the year. In the Middle East, the biggest changes would come in the form of Turkey receiving most British colonies in the region, the Sinai Peninsula, as well as French-held Syria. France and her colonies were under complete German rule during most of the war, and I don't see that changing for the time being. Syria served no importance to Germany, and Germany would definitely want to keep Turkey as an ally, as they are now the most powerful country in the Middle East. Because of this, Germany might force Vichy France to give Syria over to Turkey so it can connect with the rest of Turkey's new borders. Most notably, all of Iraq and the Levant would come under Turkish control, with the Turkish government planning to fully incorporate them into Turkey within a couple of decades. Throughout the rest of the world, there wouldn't be very many changes, except for colonial possessions changing hands, most notably those in Africa, with the colonies of Namibia, Tanzania, Cameroon being taken from Britain, along with a great deal of minor islands around the world. While many would expect Belgian colonies such as the Congo to be given to Germany, I wouldn't expect this to be the case. Belgium is essentially under the direct control of Germany, meaning that Germany has free range to do whatever they want in its colonies, causing no need for it to be handed over to Germany. In North America, the Aleutian Islands might actually go to the Soviet Union as the USSR captured a great deal of the islands during the war with no intention of returning them once the war concluded. Along with losing the Aleutian Islands to the USSR, the US would more than certainly be forced to hand over Guam, Hawaii, and all other Pacific possessions to the Japanese. After the world borders are redrawn, I would expect a great deal of the Allied powers to come under occupation, just like the Axis powers were in our timeline. For example, Germany would likely completely occupy the UK, and may even give independence to Scotland, or give Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland. While this seems preposterous, this isn't actually as far-fetched as it seems. During World War II, 
Both Northern Ireland and Scotland were feeling resentment against the English for dragging them into a conflict that they feel that they shouldn't be a part of. Germany would take advantage of their resentment, and by releasing them from the UK, could possibly gain the new nation of Scotland or completely united Ireland as potential future allies, while at the same time weakening their greatest adversary in Europe. I would also expect the US to come under occupation, with the Soviet Union occupying Alaska, Japan annexing Hawaii and occupying the Pacific coast, and Germany occupying the east coast along with the upper midwest. Obviously, no annexations in these occupied territories will be made except for Hawaii, but for the time being, all of these regions are under the direct control of the Axis. The next few years following the end of the war will likely be characterized by the war tribunals for allied leaders with military and political leaders from the US, UK, and many other allied nations facing trials similar to those in Nuremberg or Tokyo in our timeline. At the very least, I would expect Henry Wallace, whoever his vice president is, Douglas MacArthur, Winston Churchill, and Alan Brooke to be tried and punished for their actions in the war. Heavy emphasis would be put on the American detainment of Japanese Americans as a way to consolidate worldwide support for the Axis powers, just like the Allies did with the Holocaust in our timeline. As for the Holocaust itself, along with other Axis crimes such as the Nanking Massacre, they would only become a footnote in the overall history of the war. This is because most of the emphasis would be put on crimes committed by the Allied powers, such as the previously mentioned American detainment of Japanese Americans. Of course, Axis war crimes wouldn't be completely lost to history, but rather be given very little attention in the overall picture of the war, with most crimes of the war associated with the Allies instead. Beyond that, it would be impossible to say what would happen next. Maybe a Cold War emerges between Germany and Russia, maybe Britain and the US fall to fascism, maybe a third world war breaks out. All that I can definitely say is that the world would look drastically different in more than a thousand ways.